relationship-based horsemanship here in this next segment. And our, one of the questions came from one of our board members. Uh, how do you attract people to a relationship-based type of horsemanship when what they've been doing has been working for them for years? And in the world of competition, they often come out ahead of the relationship-based horsemen in many instances. What do you say? So there's this joke that says, how many missionaries does it take to change a light bulb? Okay, how many does it take? One. One. But the light has got to want to change. Oh, got it. Right? So I think many of us have been in this situation where we're so passionate about what we're doing, we know the results, we can see the pain that other horses and people are struggling with, but they're not open to changing it. They're getting by with what they're doing. And most people don't even know their problems are as bad as they are mm -hmm. because they can wrestle through it, they can struggle through it, they have a horse that's putting up with it, they're satisfied with having low scores, but they still win. And, you know, the, it's usually not until they get a horse that they really believe in, that is super talented, and they don't want to give up on it, that then they start looking outside of the box. And for sure, what we're doing in relationship-based training, whatever you want to call it, natural horsemanship, relationship-based training, anything that puts the horse first, it takes a lot for people to go, I want to do that because they think they have to sacrifice their other goals in, in order to do it, which we know is not true. So I think the more that we try to convince other people, it's like, you know, there's nothing like the converted, you know, if somebody gives up smoking, they're going to harangue you about why you shouldn't smoke. Somebody changes their diet, becomes a vegan. They're going to like pester you and you're not open to it. The light doesn't want to change. So to me, you have to be a good example and not judge other people you know I was that person I didn't know any better what I was doing with my horse many many years ago I had no idea it was cruel I didn't think drop nose bands and draw reins and all that was bad because everybody around me was doing it but I never learned to ask the horse I never saw things from the horse's point of view and when I did I was horrified and most people can't read horses they don't know and they're under the, the thumb of a, a trainer who just tells them this is what you have to do. So to me, this movement started 30 years ago, maybe a little bit more than that because of Ray and Tom and, you know, but it wasn't popularized, popularized, pop, popularized. Yeah, it, it, it had become popular. Um, yeah, until. I Dr. Miller's book talks about it in probably about your and my lifetime, but. Yeah. That was because Tom Dorrance was getting going. And of course, you and uh, your previous partner had a huge role in, in that big giant jump. Um, yeah. But yes, but it's relatively recent and we know we still have a lot to do. In fact, on that subject, Linda, um, I read one of the Happy Horse, Happy Life social media posts and, and it said only one out of 10 horses and humans are getting to experience this um i've done some research talking to different people about um you know how much market share does does relationship-based horsemanship natural horsemanship putting the horse first how, how much is that out there and we're really press pressing it to think that it's any more than five or ten percent max yeah I agree. And so one of the, the the things that we the reason why we come to, to work on the International Horsemanship Foundation, and there's a lot of volunteering, we, we do have professionals working with us, we do have um, our employees, but it's it's those of us that that got it. And you, you, you watched me because you knew me early on when I was becoming that, that zealot because I finally got it. And then I watched my wife get it. And then how what a huge change it's been for our lives. And now we want everybody to have an opportunity. And we love that you're one of our partners because in order to increase the share for the world on behalf of the horse, it's going to take a lot of us working together. And, you know, tonight's part of that. 
Yes, and, and I feel very privileged to be part of that whole movement, you know, in helping horses to get more respect, you know, and consideration. Um, but, you know, many, again, back in my other life in, in Australia, when I was um, part of the executive team for this fantastic skincare company, there was a, um, a marketing expert that came in and um, they asked the leaders, you know, so what's your goal? What do you want for Ella Bache? And they said, well, it's like Coca-Cola. I want, you know, it's for everybody that has lips, everybody that has a mouth, they should have Coca-Cola. And they looked at us and went, no, you don't have that kind of product. It's very much about a niche. And it's the same with natural horsemanship. It's the same with relationship-based training. It's the same with dressage and reining and jumping and, you know, any discipline, they're all going to be who they are and we just have to be who we are and keep moving forward you know as being advocates for the horse but to try and think that everybody's going to do this is I think a self-defeating premise because yeah. there's no like way the world hunger right it, it, yeah you have to be we do a little bit of it Right. Yeah, you have to really be quite evolved in your thinking to not have an ego, to give a horse a voice and things like that. And most people, if you think about where horses have come from, they were tools, they were machines, and um, they still serve a lot of people's ego. You know, there's not this real idea of, hey, can we collaborate and, and have a relationship based on this versus you know, I need you to win for this or do that or serve my needs. And it's not that much of a collaboration. So I think it speaks to a very much more evolved person who's attracted to this because they're willing to look at another's point of view and see themselves from that perspective. Just saying. No, I love it. That's awesome. And thank you to Surly Garber from our board who gave us that question. The next one was, what is your definition of relationship-based horsemanship? It's about putting the relationship first. So, you know, in my new curriculum, I talk about things like connection and relaxation and responsiveness and confidence. And if you try to make your horse do something like get in a trailer, go over a jump, um, do some kind of a maneuver, and the horse is tense and you don't care about that and you keep pushing them to do it, that's not relationship based. Because it's like, you're afraid, I don't care, do it anyway. Mm -hmm. What kind of relationship is that? So no matter what it is you want the horse to do, when you see that the horse is mentally and emotionally having trouble, if you back off and say, let me take care of your confidence, let me take care of your trust, and then we'll go back to that, that to me is relationship-based. Wonderful. If you carry on regardless and you wrestle through it and you're not sensitive to the horse's feelings and opinion about what's happening, then that's not relationship-based. 